Good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to be a part of this presentation. I do hope that um, some of this information resonates with you all. It's very much a new journey. Um, some of you have been there before, but the language has changed somewhat since um, the last two years. Uh, and last year was the first year of our new external senior exams and ATAR, which we were quite pleased with. And we feel the students managed very well. Um, very pleasing scores. And we do believe that individual students are benefiting from the new system as opposed to the old um, OP system with the QCS test. So as you may be aware, there's a whole range of new language and the purpose of this evening is to introduce you to some of that and to just get a snapshot of how the next two years are going to work for you and how the process will be undertaken. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. And if you need further clarification, we're here to sit down with you and explain it. Uh, and hopefully your students will be able to explain it to you as well. So don't hesitate to ask them questions and make sure that they understand what they're involved in and how it all works for them so we can maximise every opportunity. Uh, we will be very much involved with the students in their journey, particularly with the academic coaching, uh, to make sure that the students receive regular feedback and are given updates on how they can best maximise maximise their potential to get the best results at the end of year 12. So I'll now hand over to Leanne. Thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in the journey over the next two years. And I wish you all the very best for years 11 and 12. As a parent, I'm in year 11 as well. So I'm starting to experience it firsthand. And I can assure you, um, it's definitely new territory uh, when you're walk walking with them and supporting them in the process. So good luck. And thank you. Thanks, Helen. And I just realised that I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. So I'm Leanne Hickson. I'm the Head of Senior Schooling here at Corinda State High School. And I'll be very involved um, with your students as they move through their senior phase of learning. So this evening, our session is going to cover the new Queensland Certificate of Education, ATAR, we'll recap ATARs and what will contribute to an ATAR, their assessment processes here for Year 11 and 12, uh, ARA, scaling, vet opportunities and work experience as well. So moving into the QCE, and I'm sure this is familiar to those of you who came to our parent evening last year, but remember that all of our students in the senior phase of learning are striving to achieve a Queensland Certificate of Education. And to do that, they need to cover four elements. They need 20 credits from the subjects that they're studying, including their vet qualifications. They need a set pattern or completed core, which is 12 credit points that come from either core, uh, preparatory or complementary subjects. And those need to be uh, completed over four units or a completed vet qualification. They need to get to a set standard, which is a C grade or better or satisfactory completion of their VET qualifications, and they need to be, meet their literacy and numeracy components. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, it's my job here at Corinda State High School to ensure that all of your students are on track to get a Queensland Certificate of Education. And part of that process has already been um, occurring as we go through our formative tasks in the first phase of year 11. So some of you have already been contacted by me. Uh, in the future, you might have some contact from me in relation to how they've gone on their first piece of assessment, or you'll be hearing from the teachers and the heads of department from our various faculties. So we are there to make sure that your students get a QCE and that from the very beginning, we've got them on the journey and the right journey for them to ensure that they are achieving that and have success by the end of year 12. If you, any of you have any concerns about that at any point in time over year 11 and 12, then you're very welcome to be in contact with me, but it's highly likely that I'll be in contact with you first. And at this stage, um, we certainly have quite a number of our students who are achieving success in the subjects that they've selected. And if they're not, we've already put some plans in place. So it's been great to get to know some of you and to chat with your students and yourselves as we work through that journey. 
The next thing I want to talk about is the ATAR and remembering that the ATAR replaces the OP system. And this really is for use in university entry. So 33% of the population use an ATAR to apply for university entry. And if your student wants to study at university, they need to ensure that they are studying the prerequisites for the courses that they're interested in. So as some of your students come up against some challenges in the subjects that they're selected, some of the decisions we're making at this point in time is also based around whether or not that's a prerequisite for what they wanna do post school. At this point in time, my goal is to ensure that they have as many options as possible. And that's why we'll be looking really carefully at what they've selected and how well they're going. So just remember uh, to get an ATAR and to have an ATAR calculation, your students need to be in either five general subjects or four general subjects and one applied or certificate three vet qualification or higher. If you think that your student is not on the right pathway, then feel free to get in contact with me as soon as possible. Remember that an ATAR really um, is a 2000 point scale now, and it is graded from 99.95 at the top end, right down to zero at the bottom. It's a score that can be used right throughout Australia um, and it's a measure of a student's overall position as they complete their subjects here in Queensland compared to other students. Uh, it is compulsory for students to take an English subject in order to receive an ATAR, but they can be in essential English and still receive an ATAR. There's also external examinations for every general subject that they have to take, and those are undertaken at the end of year 12. So it's important that you're aware that this is a two year process, but the students need to be set up for that outcome now. Remember also that the uh, HR pathway really is for students who want to go to for university. We have applied and vet pathways that are very relevant for many students here at Corinda State High School. These are a combination of six applied and or vet subjects and the goal there is to ensure that students gain enough QCE points and combinations to gain a QCE. And this outcome can take them to an apprenticeship, a traineeship, employment, further vet study, and it may also lead to direct entry into some universities. So be assured that an applied vet pathway is a very relevant pathway for your students. And it's important that they do the best that they can at school so that they are competitive in that environment post-school. It's important that the students get the best results on their report cards because they're the tools that they'll be using to take to job interviews and even to interviews for vet courses where we have ones that are of a competitive nature. So please ensure that your students are in the correct pathway, that they're in the subjects that are suited to them and they're in the subjects that are allowing them to achieve success and lead them to the best post-school outcome for them. The next thing that I wanna talk about this evening is assessment. So it's really important to remember that we have four units as we use, move through year 11 and 12. Unit one and two are separate and they are standalone individual units. And then units three and four go together and are studied as a pair. So units three and four must be studied for the whole time. Uh, there is some flexibility and we are able to change some subject selections from unit one to unit two. But once we hit unit three, the students are locked into their subject selections and there is no opportunity for them to change subjects once they are in their unit three and four course of study. This is not our decision. This is a decision that the QCAA has made as part of their new system. And it's a process that we are really locked into. So it's important that your students are in the right subjects now as we move through the whole entire system. Uh, when we come to working uh, in the units now, we actually don't follow semesters for our, um, our units. They are slightly off the semester process. So unit one has already started and you will, unit one will conclude at the end of week six of term two. 
by week seven of term two, we'll be into unit two. And then in term four of this year, so week four, the 25th of October, 2021, unit three starts. So effectively year 12 starts in week four of term four this year. That's really important for you to be aware of because it's really important that your students are attending right to the end of week eight um, at the end of term four, because that will be the start of their unit three unit of work, which means that they'll be preparing for their first internal assessment pieces for their unit four calculations. Uh, sorry, their unit three calculations, and it's their unit three and four assessment pieces and the results from those that contribute to their ATAR calculations. We continue unit three into term th two of year 12. So at the conclusion of week two, we've finished unit three and we move into unit four. And then the external assessment exam block commences week four, term four. I haven't put the dates for those in this table because we we're just waiting for the QCAA to publish that date. But if we go on what they did last year and what they've already published for this year, then the starting date for those will be Monday of week four in term four. So we already know when the students will have assessment and we've worked our units back from there to give them the most opportunity to have the most time in their unit three and four learning. So when it comes to assessment and what you'll see in terms of um, the uh, report cards and where their assessment lies is in unit one and two, the students have all already done a diagnostic task. And from here on in, they'll have between two and four formative assessment pieces across unit one and two for their general subjects. Their school report card will be post unit. So instead of at the end of semester, it'll be at the end of the unit and a report card will go home. If you have other students at the school in our junior um, grades, you'll notice that the report cards are not coming home at the same time and that the senior report cards come at the end of units, not at the end of semesters. The students will open QCAA accounts shortly and in their QCAA account, accounts, you'll be able to see their results for every subject. And for their general subjects in unit one and two, the only mark that it will show is either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. If it's satisfactory, you've received a C grade or higher here at school and you've received a QCE point. If it's unsatisfactory, it means you've received a D or E as a school grade here at Corinda State High School and you have lost a QCE point. In units three and four, there will be three internal assessment tasks for every general subject. And these tasks will be endorsed, moderated and confirmed by the QCAA. So you can be assured of the equality assurance there. The student QCAA accounts will have the raw score tallies listed for each assessment piece after they've been confirmed. So you'll be able to have a good tracking system of the students' results as they are uploaded into their QCAA accounts. If your students are in applied or essential subjects and our essential subjects are essential English and essential maths, they are the same timing as our general subjects. There will be four formative assessment pieces in unit one and two. Their school report card will be post unit, the same as the general subjects and their QCAA accounts will also show a confirmed satisfactory or unsatisfactory result for unit one. In unit three and four, the assessment timing will be the same as general subjects for applied and essential subjects. There'll be four internal assessment subjects. The difference for our essential subjects is that essential maths and essential English will have one common internal assessment piece. So this is a task that is set by the QCAA and marked by Corinda State High School staff. The students in their QCAA accounts will have an A to E result for each dimension of their applied and essential subjects. And that's the information that you'll be able to see in their QCAA accounts. And the final form of subject that we have here at Corinda State High School are the vocational education and training subjects. So for unit one and two, 
the, the report cards come out at the same time. The assessment for these subjects is competency based, which means that once the students are deemed competent, they are deemed successful in that piece of assessment. This information won't be shown into, in their QCAA accounts until they have completed units of competency and their results have been uploaded. They won't be shown as having received the qualification until the very end of unit four. And at this point in time at completion, they'll either have the qualification awarded or they'll be deemed not yet competent and withdrawn from the remainder of the comp qualification. Because it's competency-based assessment, the students will have assessment right across units one to four um, and their report cards will reflect their progress in these subjects. It is our aim to have all VET subjects completed before the general external examinations start so that any students who are taking a combination of general and essential applied or VET subjects have completed all of their assessment before that main assessment period for the QCAA starts in term four of year 12. And you might have seen this magic document come home uh, recently. This is a summary of every subject here, every applied, general and essential subject at Corinda State High School and the timing for the assessment. Our VET subjects aren't on here because their assessment is of a continuous nature and the students have the ability to keep working on their assessment until they are deemed competent. But if you are looking for a summary of when your student has all of their assessment, then you'll find it in this document that has recently gone home to all students and parents. And it's a summary of the types of assessment that students are doing for each subject and what week you can expect it to occur in. If you look across there, you'll see that some weeks are very assessment heavy, and that's likely when we're having exam blocks or significant assessment periods at the end of units. So it's really important that you're aware of this timing and you're aware of um, the obligations for students around assessment. So to, to discuss this, I'm now going to hand over to Mr. Andrew Noble, who is one of our deputy principals. Evening parents and students. Um, so my part, I'm gonna to talk to you now. If I roll across. Okay, so part of the things I'm gonna talk about now is um, what, how our assessment runs and what to do around assessment and if there's issues of assessment. But before we start, we're gonna play a, a video here, which gives you a good summary of, particularly for ATAR students, of how to get your, how to get your best ATAR. Um, some of us will talk about some scaling, they'll talk about what to do in some of your classes, etc. And then we'll come back and have a quick chat about that after the video. Soon, Queensland Education will transition to a new system that aligns with other states and territories throughout Australia. The state government has entrusted QTAC to manage this important change. From 2020, ATAR, the Australian Tertiary Admission Rank will replace the overall position as the primary pathway to tertiary study for Year 12 students. To be ATAR eligible, students must complete either five general subjects or four general subjects and one applied subject or VET course. English is compulsory, but there are five English subjects to choose from. A process called scaling will then be applied. The purpose of scaling is to prevent the unfairness that would occur if we simply added up raw subject results. And here's why it's important. Without scaling, a score of 90 out of 100 in Maths A would be the same as a 90 out of 100 in Maths B. But that doesn't make sense. We know that Maths B is more challenging than Maths A, and things get even trickier when you look at vastly different subjects. Is achieving well in art more difficult than physics? Is chemistry harder than English? What about geography and physical education? Scaling allows comparison based on the difficulty of achieving each result. Let's break it down. Scaling works by looking at how students who take a particular subject perform in other subjects. 
This comparison tells us something about the relative difficulty of each subject. When we examine the results against large groups of students, we can determine how hard a subject is overall compared to other subjects. Until December 2020, when the first ATARs are calculated, we can't know for certain how hard a subject will be. Some subjects may scale higher or lower from one year to the next. So it's important for students to choose subjects they enjoy, that they are good at, and that are prerequisites for the further study they want to take, rather than basing choices on how a subject is likely to scale. Now, we've spoken a lot about the ATAR, but it's not the only path to uni. VET courses and applied subjects can also get students the requirements they need. And there are other life opportunities too. TAFE, apprenticeships, a gap year, even work. The future is in front of Queensland students and it can be extraordinary whichever path they choose. We are all in this together and together we'll make the transition to ATAR a positive experience for every student in Queensland. Basically what the video talks about is how to get your best ATAR and what the difference is between achieving your best and picking the right combination of subjects to do your best. Um, part of what it is is that when you did your set plan was that we looked at what it is your goals are when you finish school and then how um, that is the pathway to get you to what you want to do when you finish school. Now, what we've learnt, um, obviously now we've had a group through, we've been able to see how subjects scale and what the best things student can do is pick the subjects they're going to do the best in and make sure they try and work all the way to the end and do the best possible outcome they can. Something we have noticed is that sometimes students have ups and downs during their pathway. And it's very important during units three and four that students are consistently at school all the time, that they don't miss parts, so they can actually do the best they can on each one of those internal assessments and the external assessments. It's been quite um, interesting looking at the results we've had so far that some students have done better in one part than the other. And it, sometimes they do better in the external than they do in the internal. So it shows us that sometimes students need to make sure they work consistently over the whole unit three and four, taking the learners they learn from unit one and two and applying that to unit three and four to get the pos best possible outcome they can at the end, to get the best possible ATAR that they can. Um, remembering that also that the certificates, the Cert three and four and the diploma, can also contribute to your ATAR. But also remember that the Cert 3 and above can often give you direct entry to many university courses. Um, if you look at Griffith University, they have a large range of guaranteed courses that if you choose the right certificate, you can enter those without having to worry about your ATAR. So there's many ways your students continue to study when they post school. Okay, so moving on to that, one of the things we have to worry about then is particularly our assessment policy. So we have our school-based assessment policy, which is derived from the procedures and, and policies that the QCAA and the QCIA handbook tell us we have to use. Okay, so probably the important thing here is that there's certain responsibilities that the students and yourself as parents and carers um, need to take on board, especially when you get to grade 11 and 12. Now, grade 11, it's very important that um, in grade 12, the most important thing, and if there's one thing I can get you to remember, is all the assessment needs to be done on or before. We can't do assessment after the date, okay? The only way a student can miss an assessment piece and have something happen afterwards is because they've been ill on the day or there's been a misadventure. A misadventure might be a car crash, could be something that happened very suddenly and it just wasn't planned for, we had no idea about it. They're the only things that can accept that a student's happening after the post date, that something could happen for them. In units three and four, that means that it might be a case of the QCAA um, work out a mark for your student and they base it on the other certain pieces they have. But each one of them, once it gets to unit three and four, that all has to go through as the support of our guidance officer team to make sure that you apply correctly for that. And then that will then help um, inform the QCAA as to what the right measures are for your student to make sure they get the correct mark and they still get an equal mark to the other students in their cohort. This is evident last year with the COVID thing and that the students missed an assessment piece. And as a school, we got to choose which assessment piece they didn't do. So the QCAA did some balancing. So they have measures to make sure all students are still created, 
created, treated equally, no matter what system pieces they're done, as long as they display enough of the course, okay? Uh, the second thing is to also make sure, as I talked about before, that assessment, because remember, it's not just about completing the assessment, Part of the conditions of the QCAA when it comes to general subjects, applied subjects and essential subjects is also the hours that you're supposed to actually do to display um, the learnings of the course. This is actually part of why our unit three doesn't start until that random time of week four and term four is because by then we have shown that we've done enough hours of learning in unit one or two before the students move on to unit three and four, that grade 12 period, while maximizing the amount of time that we actually get to do in that time. Um, from here, what we're going to talk about now is about the ARA applications and what to do if there's something that can happen for your student to help them. And for that, I'm going to invite our guidance officer, Ms. Black. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as Andrew just mentioned, my name's Ashley Black and I'm the guidance officer for years 10, 11 and 12 here at Corinda State High School. Um, this evening, I'll be talking through the process for ARA, uh, which stands for Access Arrangements and Reasonable Adjustments. Um, so many or most of these details are outlined in uh, Corinda's assessment policy um, that you will find located on our school website. So with ARA, uh, it is the same practices across all schools, um, but it's individualised. So one size doesn't necessarily fit all students. So in terms of what ARA is, um, it's provided to minimise the barriers that students may face, uh, whereby they have a condition or an impairment or a circumstance that prevents them from reading, responding or participating in an assessment. So those barriers fall into three broad categories, that is permanent, temporary and intermittent. And the QCA uses four categories to determine such eligibility, cognitive, physical, sensory or social emotional. Um, so because that is quite broad um, and includes a number of different conditions, um, we we look at a number of different adjustments that can be made for our young people to enable them to successfully engage in assessment. So if we focus now on the ineligibility, um, this is really important for us to know so that we don't get stuck later on um, if something occurs and we are unaware of any in ineligibilities. So as you can see, students are not eligible for ARA on the following grounds. Um, if there is an unfamiliarity with the English English language, if there is teacher absence or other teacher related difficulties, if, they are, if there are matters that the student could have avoided, so misreading their exam timetable, misreading instructions in an exam unfortunately is not grounds for ARA, uh, timetable clashes, matters of the students or parents and carers own choosing, so family holidays, uh, sporting events are also not grounds for ARA or matters that the school could have avoided, so the incorrect enrolment in a subject. Uh, another thing to mention uh, in relation to ineligibility for ARA as well uh, is if a application is made, um, it unfortunately does not always mean that that is going to get approved. Now, we, are, we will do our best to ensure that we support all of our students in that process. Um, but what I mean by not being approved, in addition to um, the eligibility here that's in front of us, is for example, um, if a student were to have a day off school unwell um, and they applied for ARA for an additional week to complete an assignment, for example, but they have had that piece of assessment and been working on that item for a number of weeks, um, there would likely not be sufficient evidence to demonstrate the need for such an ARA if they were to only take, for example, a single day off. We could certainly look at what support we could put in place, um, but ARA may not be appropriate in that particular case. Uh, so there are two types of ARA. Um, there is general, which is for long-term or permanent conditions, um, but also for short-term conditions or temporary injuries, which fall into those four broad categories mentioned earlier. There is also the second type of ARA, which is for illness and misadventure, which uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, an unforeseen event 
event, an adverse uh, circumstance that is outside of the student's control. Um, so if that is uh, an accident, an, an injury, an immediate family circumstance uh, that has occurred, um, that we can have the documentation to go along with that as well. Which does bring me into the next slide here, uh, looking at the documentation for applying for ARA. So the documents for application do exist on the Corinda State High School website. Uh, you will see um, as appendices at the bottom of the assessment policy, uh, the outline of uh, that process, the documentation that is needed so there is the application document, there is a school statement, which is something that I will put together um, or a student's advocate may put together, but there is also other evidence that goes along with that, whether that be a medical documentation, a police report, an official notice, something that substantiates what is in the R application and evidences what has been outlined. So in the medical report, um, there are, there's information that needs to be in that uh, in order for us to determine which is or which the best, best adjustments to make for the student, um, but also moving forward, particularly into units three and four, where QCAA uh, will make the decisions about the ARA adjustments and we need to upload that documentation to them. The more information that they have, uh, the better they are able to make decisions about what to afford young people as adjustments. So in the medical report, um, which is often the most common ARA application, um, we need to see the diagnosis of a disability and or a medical condition, the date of the diagnosis, the date of the occurrence or onset, the symptoms, treatment or course of action related to the condition, information about how the condition affects the student participating in assessment, particularly timed assessment. Um, so for example, if uh, they require rest breaks or extra time or a, a varied seating um, because of their uh, condition or impairment. Uh, and professional recommendations regarding ARA. Um, so we can certainly liaise with um, your healthcare practitioners or um, write to them. Um, sometimes doctors will be unfamiliar with the process, um, depending on their level of engagement with schools. Sometimes they will see the documents and know exactly what they need to do. Um, but we're always happy to support in that process to make sure that they have indicated in that documentation all of the professional recommendations needed for a young person so we can enact that here at school. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, that does become even more important in units three and four when QCAA are making decisions, they need to be able to align the professional's recommendations with what the school is providing for that young person so they can approve those adjustments being made. Uh, so that can be to timed assessment, it can be adjustments, um, for example, things like, as I mentioned before, rest breaks, extra time, varied seating if those are needed, um, or if there are extensions to tasks um, which would need to go through a process of comparable assessment, as Andrew mentioned earlier before. Okay, I will hand back over now to Leanne. Thanks. Thanks, Ash. So one of the things that we've been talking about a lot this evening uh, is vocational education and training. And there are a number of ways that you can access um, VET and a number of outcomes for VET here at Corinna at State High School. So as, we, as we've mentioned, VET can contribute to your ATAR. So if you're studying a certificate three or higher, um, then that's a certificate for a diploma usually that can contribute to the calculation of your ATAR. Um, you can use VET as direct entry to university. Um, and we know that students who do a certificate three or higher are able to use that, that qualification in some instances in order to go directly to university. And if you study a diploma level qualification, that will give you the English equivalence for your university entry. So in some instances, you may have to have the combination of your VET qualification and general English, but at a diploma level, that diploma also allows you to have that English equivalence. Um, 
that is also very useful for QCE points. And um, what I think that most of our students end up using at least one VET qualification to calculate their QCE. And finally, VET can be used as a launching pad for a school-based apprenticeship or traineeship or post-school for a full-time apprenticeship or traineeship. So it's a very useful um, commodity to have as part of your portfolio. So in terms of the VET pathway and university entry, both UQ and QUT in their pre-COVID system have published that they will no longer allow school leaver applicants to receive a standalone selection rank on the basis of a VET award. And that's a very, very grown up sentence for them saying, you can't use your, your VET qualification straight out of school. Now, last year due to COVID impacts, QUT actually relaxed that requirement and did allow students to use a VET qualification straight out of school for direct entry to their university. Uh, so we are waiting this year to see what their post COVID position is, given that we're probably not quite out of the COVID woods yet. Uh, so we will keep you and, and the students posted on that. Um, so this is a really important time for them, especially to be checking their emails and to watching what information uh, is coming out from both senior schooling, from guidance and from the deputy principals, so that you're aware across the next couple of years of what the processes are. Having said that, it doesn't mean that you can't use it at all to get into UQ or QUT. To get into UQ, you just have to wait a period of 12 months to use your diploma for entry, and for QUT, it's two years. For all other universities, they have not released a position like this, and in 2021, they all accepted VET qualifications for direct entry purposes. Um, so a school-based apprenticeship or traineeship is something that a lot of the year 11 students have been very interested in, particularly if they are undertaking any uh, trade qualifications at TAFE or any trade qualifications here at school. So it's the process whereby you start a work-based recognised qualification one day per week while you're still at school and you get paid for this. At Corinda State High School, these are for students in year 11 and 12. We do have some students start in year 10, provided it doesn't impact on their school time, but our preference is that the students do it in year 11 and 12, where we can support them with a study line and support mechanisms to keep their schoolwork up to date, given that they're out of the school environment one day a week. What you need to remember though, is that you need to be at school for at least 50 days per year, which means that if you take into account that students come to school for 40 weeks a year, that means they have to do more work days than their school weeks here at school, which means that yes, they will need to work in their school holidays and um, potentially on the weekends. You also need to ensure that the students make and have time to get in the minimal nominal hours of training. And for most of our qualifications, that's a minimum of 100 days. Because of that nominal training time position that the Department of Training has, it means that students who are looking for school-based traineeships really need to be looking for those um, now. Uh, it's the school-based apprenticeships that we can start later because the training sign-up requirements are that the school-based apprenticeships actually roll into full-time apprenticeships post-school. So when I refer to things like school-based apprenticeships, I'm referring to thing, uh, qualifications and trades that we say have a trade outcome. So these are industry areas, areas such as electricians, hairdressers, chefs, where we say once they finish their training, they are trade qualified. School-based trainees refer to industries that don't require a trade certificate, like business, retail, or hospitality. And it is the expectation of the Department of Training that you would actually finish your qualification before you finish school. Whereas school-based apprenticeships have no chance of being able to finish their qualification. They're actually only allowed to do 25% of their qualification while they're at school. And the expectation is that their training will roll into a full-time apprenticeship post-school. So you can find out all of the uh, 600 
or more trade um, apprenticeship and traineeship options at the Australian Apprenticeship website, which is australianapprenticeships.gov.au. Um, students can also be employed both as school-based apprentices and full-time apprentices through what we call group training organisations or GTOs. And this is where the GTO employ, employs the apprentice or trainee and then places them out in industry with host employers. Some of the GTOs that we work with include MEGT, MyGas and All Trades Queensland. And you can find a full list of the um, GTOs at the website listed below. So GTOs are a very good op option for students who are looking for a trade and are one area that you can start looking if your student is looking for a school-based apprenticeship or traineeship or thinking about a full-time one in the future. So it's really important that you're looking long-term um, and looking at what is available out there for students, particularly if they're looking for trades post-school. And the reason I say that is that a lot of companies either use GTOs or they directly employ. So they don't go through SEEK or any other employment agency, they directly employ. So companies like Toyota, Hastings Deering, Rio Tinto and a whole range of um, larger companies like that actually start their recruitment process now in, for students who are in year 12 um, for post-school apprenticeships. So you need to start having these um, opportunities on your radar. You need to start looking this year at what the timeframes are so that you don't miss them next year. So if your students are looking for trade-based opportunities post-school, you need to start looking at where it is that you'd like to position them and what it is you'd like to be looking for so that you don't miss the opportunities next year because once they close, they'll be gone for a year. So you can find um, information about all of the school-based apprenticeships and traineeships and a lot of um, information about the full-time apprenticeship that, that come to the school at the senior schooling uh, student page. So to find this, the students need to go to SharePoint and then on SharePoint, they need to go to the senior schooling section that I've highlighted there. And then once you click into the senior schooling section, we have um, all of our job vacancies that come through to us listed um, on the homepage of the senior schooling section. So when I walked out of my office today and I checked that today, we have something close to 300 jobs up there if um, your students are looking for those opportunities. The other uh, important section of our um, our page on the student SharePoint is the Virtual Careers Expo. So on here, there are all of the GTOs listed, all of the universities listed, and all of the RTOs that provide post-school training. So if you're looking for a single point of contact to look at what post-school options that your student may be able to uh, engage in and be looking towards, then you can find all of the information at our Virtual Careers Expo. Last year, your students hopefully would have uh, completed a work experience component of their certificate to an active volunteering. So work experience is a very valuable tool for trying out different occupations. Some of your students uh, will have um, work experience as part of their VET courses in year 11 and 12. And this is called compulsory vo vocational placement as part of their VET training. Um, it can also be a trial process for a school-based apprenticeship or traineeship. Um, and it's also an opportunity for students to try out different industries and different jobs and see if that really is the pathway to, for them. In my experience, if you are looking for a school-based apprenticeship or traineeship, particularly in a trade area, then work experience is the most successful way to end up with a school-based apprenticeship that converts into a full-time apprenticeship. Um, what happens is that the employer and the students are able to try, um, see, if, see if they're suited to one another, see if that job and that industry area is actually what the student wants to be in, ensure that they're committed to the process before we start the process of signing them up into the school-based apprenticeship 
or the full-time apprenticeship. So if you are um, looking for that opportunity, uh, what the steps to follow are to identify um, an employer who is willing to take you on for work experience. We do have some information of employers and often we get employers ring us and say, I'm happy to take a, a work experience person or I'm looking on um, for a full-time apprentice or I'm looking for a school-based apprentice, but I wanna do some work experience first. So we'll always put those opportunities out to the students. If it's part of your VET course, you need to talk to your teacher um, and they'll be able to outline the requirements for your compulsory vocational placement. Once you've identified an employer, you need to come and see me to determine if the timing is suitable. Because we are locked into assessment timeframes and because we have such stringent um, requirements from the QCAA about when students complete assessment now, we need to make sure that we're not impacting on that and not adversely um, impacting the student in terms of their subject results. Our preference is always the school holidays for work experience, but we do have some flexibility in some of the weeks that are a little quieter for the students. What we then need to do is complete the work experience agreement form, which looks a little bit like this. Uh, and then that must be completed prior to students attending any form of work experience. So this is basically um, a legal obligation for us and it's effectively the student's work cover should anything go wrong while they're on the job site. Uh, we have had some organisations try and tell us that their work experience forms are fine. Our advice from the Department of Training legal team who actually liaise and coordinate this particular process is that no paperwork except for ours is what we'll be accepting. So don't let anyone tell you that their work experience paperwork is sufficient to ensure you have full work cover whilst your students are on the job for work experience. They need to have the Department of Training uh, work experience documentation. So the students just need to make contact with me. We'll arrange the paperwork. We'll arrange um, the uh, time off from school and we will get them out on the placement. And hopefully that will lead to school-based apprenticeship opportunities, potentially full-time opportunities. Um, and we will support the students where we can in this process. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Jake, um, the Year 11 Deputy, who I'm sure you've heard of a lot, just to wrap up our evening this evening. Uh, evening, everyone. I thought I would just jump on. As you can see, there's a lot of people in the background that work to obviously get the students through to the end of Year 12 and achieve their QCE. Um, but essentially, at the end of the day, there are a few things that obviously we try to make sure that the kids kind of stay on top of in order to help themselves and get the best result for themselves. Um, the biggest thing is obviously keeping calm. Um, as you can see, there's a whole heap of people in the background, but there's also their teachers. You've got Miss Brown as well, who's a year 11 dean, and we'll obviously go into year 12 as well. Um, and I'll also follow the kids up into year 12. So the biggest thing is about them keeping calm and seeing the people that they need to, if they do need to go speak to people. The biggest thing is talk to your teachers, get the kids to talk to their teachers if they're worried about assessment or they're not completely understanding something. So um, what I always suggest to the students is obviously go talk to their teacher first. Failing that, there's always heads of department. And then as I said, there's always people that you've already come spoken to um, tonight or that have spoken tonight. So um, that's one of the things. Obviously attending every day is a very, very big thing. Um, it's not rocket science that our high achieving kids tend to be those kids that are here for, for most of the time. So um, our guide is obviously 95% um, attendance. So obviously trying to attend every single day, trying your hardest again, it's, it's really not a rocket science to how you do your best, but trying your hardest. And that, and even if, we, if you are struggling, as I said, going and seeing those people being organized, but also about prioritizing what you need to be doing as well. So um as we have sent out to the students, there is an assessment plan uh, for units one and two so far. So the students can actually be organized and they can work out when their assessment is. So make sure that they develop a plan, that they have the materials for class, that they're on time and that they're prepared for learning is I guess the biggest thing. Um, there's obviously a balance that comes to this as well though. And as much as we say, try your hardest and be organized, there is that balance that we want kids to be enjoying school. And so if there is any issues, um, if you feel like there is any wellbeing issues, 
as kind of Miss Black is here as the guidance officer for 10s, 11s and 12s, 100% touch base with her. But then there's also there's teachers, but as, as mentioned, there's me and Miss Brown, I'll be looking after the year 11s as well. Ask plenty of questions. We encourage students to ask questions. We ask them to take advantage of support. There's tutorial classes um, in the afternoons for mostly your math, science, English, and humanity subjects. Um, so that's happening every week. It's available now for free, um, occurring in the library or Q1 and Q2. Um, but we encourage students to go and take those opportunities as well. Those teachers, there are teachers that specifically go there, but then there are tutors as well that we employ um, from the school to, to help with the kids. Um, and lastly, and probably one of the most important things is that we have academic coaching for year students in years 11 and 12. So uh, students in years 11 will be assigned an academic coach that will be with them for two years. Um, and they will look at the students' results and they'll make sure that they, they're coming up with a plan of attack for those students um, to make sure that they achieve their QCE. So uh, as I said, the students will probably be introduced to academic coaching very, very soon. Um, and they'll find out who those, who those teachers are and who those heads of departments are that work with those students. Um, but as I said, there's a lot that goes into it and we do wanna make sure that we support the students as best as we can. Um, and that's why we've got all these people here tonight to have a chat to you, to inform you, to give you the best idea of what's going on, but so that you also know who to touch base with. And at the end of the day, if you're not 100% sure, always get in touch with me, or as I said, Miss Brown, who's the Dean for year 11. Um, and we can at least direct you to where you need to go. or We can try our best to answer the questions that you might have. So um, as I said, at the very end of the day, make sure that you ask questions. It doesn't hurt to ask. Um, and we'll do our very best to make sure that we support your student and support you to, to get the results that they hopefully want to achieve. Um, so I'm going to hand back to, to Leanne really quickly now. And I only jumped on really briefly, uh, but I'm going to hand back to Leanne just to answer some of the questions that may have popped up throughout the evening. Um, and then also just to kind of do a final wrap up. Just a reminder for those people that did jump on kind of halfway through, um, we have recorded this session and we'll just send out the link to, to you all um, at some point. So if you feel like you've missed anything or you want to revisit something, um, as I said, the, the session has been recorded. But as I said, we'll, we'll hand back to Leanne and um, yeah, we'll answer some questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'll just um, answer a couple of questions that have already come through while we were talking. So just a bit more information on academic coaching. So I will actually um, assign the students an academic coach next term and we'll have our first academic coaching session with the, the year 11 students um, at the um, conclusion of unit one. So once we've got a full set of results for them, but academic coaching um, isn't just about their academic achievement. Um, it's a very holistic conversation with the students. So we'll look at their attendance, we'll look at their achievement, both academically and around the school, and we'll look at something that we call total fitness. So we'll look at all of the inputs into their success here at school, including uh, their social and emotional well-being, their physical well-being, their aspirations, what it is they're trying to achieve. I'll also send home um, a letter just before we start that process to you, um, outlining a bit more of the detail and when it is you can expect your students to have academic coaching. And we've just done academic coaching with our year 12 students for the first time this year. And it was really great for me to touch base with my, my year 12s to see how they've settled into um, year 12 and being the seniors of the school, but also ensuring that they're on track because effectively they're just about halfway through unit three. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that they're, they're knuckling down, they're aware of the time frame. So it's a really great tool for everyone. Um, another question that we've had uh, come through is about um, defense jobs. So defense is a very complex beast. Um, and I'm going to say straight off the bat that on the 3rd of May 2021, we are having a face-to-face -face careers expo, which is very exciting because we didn't get to have this last year and defence are coming. So if your students are very interested in defence at any level, I would encourage them to come to the careers expo that we're having in May and to ask the defence recruiting team directly. But um, the minimum entry for defence is that you have to have completed year 10 with a pass in English and maths. 
um, you have to be an Australian citizen and you have to be aged between 17 and 55 in order to um, apply to go into the defence. Uh, if you have a year 12 student, I've just emailed them out today, the defence gap year application. So as lots of information comes through um, regarding defence, we will forward that on to the students always and it'll go on the virtual careers expo section of the senior school and the SharePoint page. Any other questions? No? Excellent. Well, if you um if you do have any questions in the future, please feel free to contact us at any time. It'd be great to talk to you. And uh, I'd like to thank you for being part of our information evening this evening. And uh, thank you for being with us. And we'll hopefully speak to you in the near future. Thanks, everybody.